Now, the Michigan Department of Health recently put out a news release for their public, and I thought it would be an interesting topic to talk about today. And it's entitled, Spring is Here and Wildlife are Active. Be aware of rabies in Michigan. And they go on to say that warmer weather creates additional opportunities for outdoor activities in Michigan and increases the chances of wildlife encounters. Michiganders are reminded to adopt practices that protect their families and animals from rabies. So that takes me to, to this the couple of stories that really have some lessons to be learned, right? And the first one is, is a recent one, and that's out of Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, the Pittsburgh area. And it says baby raccoon is the 14th animal to test positive for rabies in Allegheny County. And it says the Allegheny County Health Department would like the person who dropped off a baby raccoon recently at the Humane Animal Rescue Wildlife Center in Verona to get in touch. The animal tested positive for rabies and authorities would like to know where it was found. So lesson learned here about handling wild animals. We don't know if this person was exposed. We don't know anything uh, based on this news report. And then there was another story that a lot of lessons learned here also. And this is from November of last year. And this is, as far as I know, the last human rabies case in the United States. And it was a man in Utah. It's actually the first uh, human rabies case in Utah since 1944. And the gentleman and his wife had a home and they had a lot of bats in the house. And his wife says she didn't realize that the bats that had frequented their home were carriers carriers of a rabid and highly contagious virus. The bats never hurt us, she said, and we were always catching them in our hands and releasing them outside because you hear all the time how bats are good for the insect population and you don't want to hurt them. The bats would lick our fingers almost like they could taste the saltiness of our fingers, but they never bit us. And it goes on to say, um, she wants the others to be aware of the risk because her husband, 55-year-old man, died from rabies from a, a bat bite. And she says, I had no clue, she said. We would wake up in the night and they would be walking on our bed. I've always thought that bats were kind of cute, but I had no idea the kind of risk we were at. So yeah, lesson number two, again, don't mess with wildlife. Well, what do we know about rabies in the United States? Well, this is uh, rabies surveillance in the U.S. in 2017. This is out of the Journal of American uh, Veterinary Medical Association. And they said during 2017, 52 jurisdictions reported about 4,500 rabid animals to the CDC. Uh, a slight decrease from the previous year. And 91% of them involved wildlife species. So it was 32% bats, about 29% raccoons, 21% skunks, 7% foxes, 6% uh, cats, and about 1% dogs. And some livestock were under 1%. Now it says, rabies is a zoonotic disease caused by RNA viruses of the genus Lysavirus. All mammals are susceptible to rabies virus infection. Rabies virus is commonly transmitted via the bite of an infected animal, but can also be transmitted when fresh saliva from an infected animal comes into contact with wounds or mucous membranes of another animal. Rabies is almost invariably fatal once clinical symptoms develop. Worldwide, there's about 59,000 people that die from rabies every year. And almost all of them, at least 99% of these deaths are the result of a rabies virus variant that circulates in dogs. 
Well, in the U.S., canine rabies was successfully controlled during the late 1970s, and wildlife accounts for at least 90% of all rabbit animals reported since the 1980s. Uh, the primary reservoir species responsible for maintaining uh, rabies virus variants in the U.S. are bats, raccoons, striped skunks, gray foxes, arctic foxes, and mongoose. Um, with the exception of bat rabies virus variants, circulation of distinct RVVs associated with the primary reservoir species occurs in geographically definable regions, and I'll show you that in a map in a moment, where transmission is primarily between members of the same species. In contrast, the nature of bats has resulted in a broader distribution of their associated RVVs and more frequent transmission between closely related bat species. In the United States, the number of human rabies cases have been dramatically reduced through the successful elimination of canine rabies virus variants, animal control programs, vaccination of wildlife, timely administration of post-exposure prophylaxis, very important, and education of healthcare professionals and the public. But despite these advances, human rabies cases still continue to happen in the U.S. Uh, there's, CDC says there's about one to two cases a year on average. And it's typically associated with bat exposures in this country or people that were exposed to rabid dogs in countries outside of the United States where uh, canine rabies is endemic. Okay, continuing on. Here's the map I was telling you about. And it says, although cross-species transmission of rabies does occur, rabies virus variants are primarily transmitted within single species. And we're, I mentioned that already. And it's really um, mapped out by animal. And you can see the United States and see most of the East Coast. Uh, top to bottom is a raccoon. Uh, fox is in Texas. Skunk is in Texas and part of the Midwest. Skunk is in um, uh, the upper Midwest, fox in uh, New Mexico, Arizona, skunk in California, arctic fox in Alaska, and Puerto Rico, uh, mongoose. Now, rabies post, well, when you get bit, you got to really take care of this because this is really, really important. And the CDC tells us that you know, regardless of the risk of rabies, you still need to really wash these bite wounds um, for a number of reasons, uh, not only for helping to helping in prevention of rabies, it's, 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 it's the first step, but also um, other types of infections that could have been transmitted. And you should also, if you haven't, if you're not up to date on your tetanus vaccine, you should be immunized also. Um, then you should also uh, be in contact with a healthcare provider so they can determine based on where you were, what type of exposure it was, um, whether you may need uh, rabies post-exposure vaccinations. And this includes a human rabies immunoglobulin, which is essentially preformed antibody, which they're going to put in uh, right around the bite area. Um, and then there's going to be a, a vaccine series. The vaccine series is typically four shots. Uh, day zero, three, seven, and 14, you'll be getting these vaccines. And this, of course, will produce antibody in you. The immune globulin is there to cover that period uh, prior and if you're immunosuppressed in any way, I believe there's a five uh, vaccine series for those types of patients. And that kind of brings me to back to the Utah story. And uh, this Utah family, this was a headline in February. Sticker shock, Utah family facing $50,000 rabies vaccination bill. When I first saw that, I said, holy cow. They had to pay $50,000 for, you know, the, the wife? No, it goes beyond that. Apparently, 
uh, dozens of people from his family. 25 member, family members had to be vaccinated too because of exposure at the hospital. Um, so between the wife and 25 family members, uh, the even after insurance, family members owed a total of $50,000. So about $2,000 a piece. And, and rabies vaccines are not cheap. However, not getting them is, is it can be fatal, right? The CDC says the estimated public health expenditure on rabies disease diagnostics, prevention, and control in the U.S. is $245 to $510 million annually. This estimate is based on available data on costs associated with the vaccination of companion animals, national rabies diagnostic testing, and for biologics for rabies post-exposure prophylaxis and pre-exposure prophylaxis. However, the total expenditures on rabies accounting for associated healthcare costs, animal control measures, and time lost from work is much greater. The number of PEP treatments given in the U.S. each year is unknown. However, it is estimated to be about 40 to 50,000 people. When rabies becomes epizootic or enzootic in a region, the number of PEP treatments in that area increases. Although the cost varies, a course of rabies immune globulin and four doses of vaccine given over a two-week period typically exceeds $3,000. The cost per human life saved from rabies ranges from approximately $10,000 to $100 million, $10, to $100 million, depending on the nature of the exposure and the probability of rabies in the region. And let me go ahead and close out because remember the first story we looked at? It was uh, somebody dropped off a rabid baby raccoon at a humane society. Don't know anything about it. Don't know if they were exposed um, and the second story, of course, was the Utah man uh, who had bats basically throughout his house. So rabies prevention, and the, and the first one is really key, avoid direct human contact or direct human and domestic animal contact with wild animals. That, that should be number one. If it's a wild animal, unknown animal, stay away from it. Have your vet vaccinate pets and at-risk livestock. And, and that's true. I mean, if you have horses or, or cattle or sheep or whatever, they need to be vaccinated also. Uh, do not allow your pets to run free. Follow the leash laws by keeping pets and livestock secured on your property. Never feed wild or stray animals to avoid attracting them with outdoor food sources. Um, and if your pet or your animal is attacked by a wild, stray, or unvaccinated animal, do not examine your pet for injuries without wearing gloves. Do not wash your pet with soap and water to remove saliva from the attacking animal. And do not let your animal come in contact with other animals or people until the situation can be handled by animal control or a county health department staff. Educate the public to reduce contact with stray and feral animals. Support animal control in efforts to reduce feral and stray animal populations and provide pre-exposure prophylaxis for people in high-risk professions, animal control, vets, etc., etc. cetera, et cetera. And going back to the Utah story, bat-proof your homes. So yeah, some, some information here. If you have contact, contact, wash it, wash your wound, contact your healthcare provider or the Department of Health. Uh, have them evaluate it. If you require PEP, get the PEP. And, and don't put off. It, this is not a medical emergency. However, it is of medical urgency. So it's got to be done pretty quickly afterwards. So, and again, do not mess around with wild and stray animals. That's always a bad move. Okay, well, I hope this was some of some help. And uh, if you liked what you saw, Go ahead and hit the subscribe button, leave me a comment, um, you know, and, and just enjoy the page. I hope you like it, and I'll see you next time for the next Infectious Disease News Brief. And don't forget to check us out at the website, OutbreakNewsToday.com, the podcast, Outbreak News Interviews, which can be found on the website, on Apple Podcasts, 
Stitcher Radio, and Spotify. And the Outbreak News This Week radio show, which is aired Sundays at 1 p.m. Eastern Time in the Tampa Bay area on AM 1380 The Biz, or online streaming at 1380thebiz.com. And check out our social media presence, Facebook, at Infectious Disease News, and Twitter, at BackDman63. Outbreak News TV is a production of The Global Dispatch. Copyright The Global Dispatch Incorporated 2019.